Do you find yourself just saying, ah, I'm so bored. <clears throat> now, today we have these little devices, and they keep us from some sense of boredom, boredom, but if we're honest, even the phones and the gadgets and the games and the TV shows foster a sort of, sort of boredom. Because even when you watch all of those, play all of those, or involved with all of those, you still say, and I still say, I'm so bored. Right? <clears throat> You're bored, I'm bored, everybody's bored. Wow, we're pretty boring. And then the question comes when you're not feeling so good. Why, why bother? I'm bored. I'm a little sad. Why, why bother wash the dishes? They can just sit there. Why, why bother clean? I haven't had anybody over in two years at least. Why, why bother like, getting a shower today? I mean, does it even matter? Nobody notices. Nobody gets that close to me anymore, right? Everybody has so much distance. I'll just spray a little extra perfume, a little more cologne, a little more deodorant. You know, it's okay. Not necessary. Why, why bother shaving? Why bother cleaning up? Why bother? And then, does it even matter? I mean, even when I clean, even when I get a shower, I'm dirty. Everything gets dirty again. What's the point? This is just annoying. These things I have to do to just maintain life. It's so obnoxious. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had that feeling about just life in general and about all the things? I mean, just everything? Just everything? And then, when you're really not feeling it, do I matter? That's an awful question, isn't it? Because a part of that is, does anybody care about me? Do I care about anybody enough that I matter to them, that they matter to me? Do I matter? That's an awful question, isn't it? But it's also an amazing question. Because if you'll be honest with yourself, you do matter. You matter incredibly. Everyone sitting around you, near you, nearby, they care about you. And I just want to clarify that before we go any further. <laughs> you matter. You may not feel like it some days. I don't feel like it some days. <laughs> but we all matter. The people that see you here, even when you say, I'm so old, I can't hardly do anything. Nobody really cares about me. I mean, yeah, I go to church. It's out of habit, blah, 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 right? I mean, you could just blah, blah, blah again and again on that, right? But at the same, do you know that our elders talk about how encouraged they are to see you here? Just to see you here, they say, that does my heart good. I love them, and yeah, I probably don't talk to them enough. Yeah, I probably am not involved in their life enough. But I love them, and it is encouraging to know that they're still coming and faithful. And they're, they're struggling to live a good, meaningful life even still. Now, we could go to the other side of the spectrum and all the younger people here, all the children could say, do I matter? I mean, does anybody really care about me? I'm just a little kid. You matter incredibly. One, because you're some of my kids. Like, two of them, right? <laughs> two, because we love our children. We love our grandchildren, and we think the world of you. And for those who are not attached to families here, but you're yet younger, and let's just say this. When you have somebody who's 98 in the church, everybody under the age of 50 is basically a child. So all of us under 50, you are a child. And you are loved as a child in this church. Or a grandchild even. I mean, you're really a grandchild, let's be honest. <laughs> so, but you are loved, dearly loved. And you matter. And this idea of mattering is incredibly important. If you feel you don't matter, then all of life can become very, very deeply depressing. But if you feel you do matter, then all these questions are just 
an itch, a little scratch, a little something to remind you, I need to get about doing something that's meaningful because I'm bored, because I don't care, because I'm asking these awful questions of does my life matter? And the answer is yes. And the issue is what are you doing that matters? Because that will remove your boredom. You will live again when you step into life, okay? That's what I've found for me. And today, our title is Reenchanting Life. Making the world beautiful again, recognizing the beauty around us, in us, beside us. Seeing others as beautiful works of art in God's hands. Seeing nature again in a meaningful way. To make life meaningful in a way that there is still mystery and adventure and desire out there that is calling to you. Live. Live. Put down the device and live. Walk away from the TV and live. Reconnect with people and live. That's what this whole sermon series is about. It's a new sermon series about life. A real, honest-to-goodness life. And today we're talking about the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you can tell, but that's a dove in the middle of this painting. And I made this, I just want you to know. With the help of an AI, a little, a bot. The other thing too, I made that with, with the help of a bot. But I chose the things that make it work together. So if you like it, thank you. I appreciate that. If you don't, you have poor taste, okay? I'm just going <laughs> to... But the Holy Spirit. What are the other images of the Holy Spirit? There's the dove. Can you think of some other imagery of the Holy Spirit? The what? Fire. Light. Anything else? Fire, light, dove, wind. You, it's hard to imagine wind, right? But there's the, the, the blowing things that are now on your phone as emojis, right? <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is who we're talking about today. And as we do that, I'd like us to pray. God, we cry out to you, give our life meaning. God, we cry out to you, help us to understand how to have meaning in this world and to know that we matter and the people around us matter and that we love and desire real community, real connection, real life. We want to live. God, give us that today in a way that we can touch, feel, taste, know, experience, and that we, we, we embrace that, God. May we feel and know your presence. As, as I speak, may we all hear your words. As we hear your words, may our hearts open, our eyes open, our ears open, and our mind open to know you more. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> what do you do when things don't make sense? When you don't get it, when you can't explain it, what do you do? Do you run away and go, Ugh. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. This is too much. Or do you run towards it and say, how do I, how do I, how do I figure it out? It's a puzzle to be solved. Or do you go, hey, um, George, can you help me? <laughs> Come over here, this thing, it's an enigma. I can't figure it out. How, do this, how does this work? What do you do when it doesn't make sense? And what do you do when life doesn't make sense? What do, you, what do you do when things just are... Do you recalibrate somehow? Do you readjust? Do you reset? Do you go back to something and go, oh, yeah, 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 I'm going to tell that story to myself again how this whole thing works. I'll just let you know on a little secret, a little secret about me. I do this on a regular basis. <laughs> if I start to struggle with something and I'm just... <clears throat> all out of sorts, and my brain is just, <clears throat> you know how that feels, right? When you can't, your words aren't making sense, your, your life is just kind of feeling chaotic, and you're like, whoa, hey, what, I don't know, I can't, this is, I got to grab onto something, this is just too much, right? And you hold on for dear life, and you say, God, what is the point? And what do you do? Here's what I do. I go back out into nature, I look around, and I say, this is beautiful. And I say, this 
the sunset, what a joy. And then, and then I look at the trees and the flowers and the rocks even. And I look at the ocean and I watch the waves roll in. And I say, God, this, I don't believe this happened by chance. God, I trust that you did this. God, I, 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 I believe there's a designer behind it all. And I come back to you, God, and I say, help me understand how all this works. And then I tell myself the story of my life and how I got to where I am today and what it is I need to do next. What is it God is calling me to do? What is it that I feel like it is mine to do and I need to do it in a way that is good and right? And then I go do that thing. When life doesn't make sense, I do my best to turn back to God and try to walk through who I am, where I am, how I got here. Do, do you ever do that? Yeah? Yeah? Some of you do that? Some of you just go, ah, whatever. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> right? Do you turn on the TV? How do you find comfort? How do you find, like, connection? Do you go talk to a friend? Do you open your Bible? Do you pray? What is it that gives you that sense of grounding again when things are just messed up? Part of it for me is the Holy Spirit, that I very much believe that God works through the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit is part of God. Now, when we get to all of that, can you explain the Trinity? Do you understand incredibly well Father, Son, Spirit, and how they're three, but one? Can, can anybody explain that? Because that's a mystery to me. Anybody, I mean, I get it, but it, it's a little difficult, right? It's one of those things that doesn't make sense and I still struggle with. <laughs> and I've studied it pretty, pretty in depth. <laughs> and I'm still like, nah, what do I do with this? So... We're in Acts. We're talking about the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit plays through this, this first big momentous Sunday in the church. And so when, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together, all together. Who's all together? All the people, the 120 that were in the upper room, uh, waiting for the promise of Jesus that he would send his spirit to them. And so they're up there in the upper room uh, waiting on this day and, and just like, what are we going to do? And they're in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing, like the blowing of a violent wind. That doesn't sound good. Violent. Oh, I, have you heard violent winds before? I mean, here when the Santa Ana blows and it's 100 miles per hour or whatever crazy number it is, I mean, it's just like the, 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 the gates on the house just rattling the whole time, right? I mean, it's just insane. And then it feels like the house is going to maybe picked up or something, and you just hear all the windows shaking a little bit, and it's like, what's going on? It kind of compares in, in, a, in a slight way to the tornadoes of the Midwest, right? And you're just like, oh, this, when is this going to stop? And then it comes and goes and comes and goes, fits and starts here and there, and you're just like, this is just crazy. And then it gets really hot, right? And so I'm imagining this violent wind rattling, well, they didn't have windows exactly, but, you know, the, the things that they add as windows, like flapping around all the shutters, curtains, whatever it was, right? And then, and then all the stuff in the town maybe is moving around a bit, and, and, it, and it comes to this one place and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Can you imagine the whole town? Just, it's as if a tornado came through the whole town, and then it just, whoop, went to a house. <laughs> like, how would you feel if your house was where the tornado, like, went in and stopped, Nobody has the, the Game Boys or the uh, Xboxes or the Facebook or the Instagram or the TV uh, uh, or, or the Netflix or the whatever else you're doing, right? They're all working at something with their hands. They're all involved in some community gathering. They hear this, see this, and then they run. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you run? You, they run to that house and they're like, what's going on? This is strange. This is weird. This is different. How did this happen? Where did this come from? We've not experienced this before. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them. How many? All. All of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Woo, that's a little weird, right? All of a sudden, people speaking in language they hadn't studied, and like, there's fire on top of their head, maybe on their head, maybe they're engulfed in fire, maybe they're like in fuego, just a light. Maybe their whole body is shining. Do you remember Moses in the Old Testament? He would go up and talk to God, get the Ten Commandments, come back down, and people would be like, you got to cover that up, Moses. You're on fire. Like, we can't look at you. You're too beautiful, too radiant. You're glowing. You're scaring us. Put a, put a bag over that. And he did. But they're not putting a bag over their head. They're not, they're not hiding their faces. <clears throat> Instead, this powerful Holy Spirit that came the whole way through the community, that just stirred everything up and caused everybody to run and see what's going on. And then the fire, whatever that is, right? And then they're speaking in tongues. And, and like, so languages they haven't studied. And then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Because there's a, there's a few verses between where he describes all the different languages they're speaking. And the, the crowd's going, they're drunk, they're drunk. Something's wrong here, but they're drunk. Like, they've been having too much, folks. Maybe an all-nighter, we don't know. Fellow Jews... And all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. You don't get it. You're questioning the reality of the situation. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only 9 in the morning. Do you know anybody that's been drunk at 9 in the morning? I do. <laughs> there are people that are drunk at 9 in the morning. And it could be because they've been drunk since last night, or it could be they woke up drunk, or it could be they woke up and started drinking. There are people that do that. But Peter here is saying, not these folks. You know these people. You see them around town. They don't have a habit of drinking at 9 a.m. They are not drunk. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Who? Hold on. Ears perk up. All the people running around the community, right? They're all Jews. They're all coming to hear and see this, and they're going, hey, hey, hey. You said Joel, a prophet? This is fulfilling something? What's this fulfilling? What are you talking about? What's the prophecy that you're talking about? Okay. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. How many people? A few people, some people, just those people, all people. Everybody's going to get the spirit. Oh, what's that mean? So I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your sons and daughters. You might think they don't have much to say, but God's going to speak through them. Ooh, that's interesting. Your young men will see visions. You know, the guy who's not yet mature enough to handle whatever. You wouldn't hand him the plow. You wouldn't hand him the hammer. He's not ready for it, but God's saying he's ready to speak for me. Whoa, what's that? Uh, your old men will dream dreams. So you 98-year-olds, you're going to have some visions. Your eyes are going to be open to new things. Maybe your spiritual eyes, your physical eyes, we don't know. But you guys that are like old, and you know you're old. We know you're old. It's not being rude. Bible says old men will dream dreams. Like they're all going to see stuff they've never seen. How would you feel about that? Like from... From the little ones to the old ones. Everybody's going to see this. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So hold on, before we go any further. What does it mean to prophesy? Speak the word of God, to tell visions. What's it mean to prophesy? Is it like, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen 20 years from now. Am I a fortune teller if I prophesy? I don't think that's what it is. I think what, what these guys said, somebody who speaks for God. A, a prophet is someone who speaks for God. Somebody who prophesies is someone who is called by God to speak to others and to share a message. Now, from this, we would say it might be visions they've had, it might be dreams they've had. But it could also be God just has a message. And then they tell others, right? It doesn't have to be dreams, but it could be. So that's interesting, right? 
Everybody's going to have this. Everybody. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. I don't know about you, but I've never really understood that. <laughs> Nobody's quite sure what that is, how much, how often, when, where. Nobody's quite sure. Now, you could say all of this was the crucifixion. Because you remember on the day of the crucifixion, there was darkness. There was darkness in the middle of the day when there wasn't supposed to be darkness. There was darkness. And ancient people, if, the, if, the, if there was a, a lunar eclipse, solar eclipse, that was a big deal. All the fortune tellers and the prophets would come out and have a word. They'd say something, you know, oh, this is saying that there's a terrible thing going to happen. Blah, 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 blah. Actually, it's just the sun and the moon aligning in the right way, and, and you get darkness. <laughs> That's what we understand, right? All of, all of that, we can explain. The, the billows of smoke, well, the blood, I don't know about. The fire and the billows of smoke, well, when, when, when major eruptions of volcanoes happen, we now know where that comes from, don't we? That's the pressure under the earth building up. The, the thing is too hot, and, the, and it, it's just, it's, it's erupting. It's a scientific explanation. We, we know what happens, right? So we don't look to those as signs anymore. All of that stuff, we can go, nah. And the sun will be turned to darkness. We just talked about that. And the moon to blood. Did we have a blood moon recently? Do you remember that? Yeah. We know what causes that, right? There's a certain shift, a certain angle, a certain this, a certain that, and you get red on the moon. We, we know scientifically why these things work, right? And so before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, well, what is the great and glorious day of the Lord? Could that be Pentecost? Could that be Resurrection Sunday? Could it be both of them? Is there another day? Are we waiting for the second coming? And when the second coming is about to happen, all this stuff will happen? There's different ways to read this. There's different ways to understand it. Whatever it means, it could mean all three of those things, in fact. It could be a sign for the resurrection. It could also be a sign for Pentecost. And then it could be a sign for the second coming. But what we do know is verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All those signs, and then when Jesus even talked about it, he talked about rumors of wars and earthquakes and all these things, and people are going to talk about all this terrible stuff that's happening, and, and they're going to keep talking about it and talking about it. And How many of you are tired of prophets telling you Jesus is coming back on April 22nd, 19, oh, we're in the wrong decade, oh, hold on, wrong century, uh, 2036, that's when he's coming. Now, if that happens, I will be amazed. I am not that kind of prophet. <laughs> and everybody that's ever predicted Jesus' return so far has been wrong. So, <clears throat> What we do know, though, is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does it mean to call on the name of God? What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? To call on the name of Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus? Because that's, a, you know, the Trinity, all of those. What's that mean? Well, <clears throat> there's this whole passage in between this and this where, where Jesus is told to be the one that they crucified, who's the Messiah they should expect. And they say, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. This is Peter. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That's a powerful statement, right? The, the one you killed, that's the Savior. You were waiting for one. <laughs> he did arrive. You killed him, and now he's resurrected. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? I've heard this, this verse since I was a kid. You know those other verses before it, though? I hadn't heard so much. Those other verses, they kind of went silent. But this one I've heard a ton. <clears throat> Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is pretty clear, right? This is pretty simple, right? Here's the thing. If you don't understand something, 
Do you just give it all up and walk away? Or do you go, what do I understand? What can I do that I know? What is it that I am not doing that I know I could do? The way God works is he, he, he gives an ongoing revelation in some sense. And, and that's not any weird hocus pocus kind of a thing. What I mean is this. When you obey this much, you understand this much. When you obey this much more, you get a little more understanding, y'all. <laughs> so if you haven't yet been baptized, what's holding you up? That is like the jumping off point for getting into Jesus, right? That's the beginning of where life happens. Now, if you have been baptized and you're going, I don't know why I'm not growing anymore. I don't understand why I'm not like maturing. I, I, have I just arrived? Am I done? Am I spiritually there? Have I, have I done all I can do? No. The issue is you know some things that you could, ought, should maybe consider living with, doing, and you're not. And the Holy Spirit has prompted you, and you've gone, ah, not today, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> and then you felt it again, hello, Holy Spirit knocking, and you went, nah, not today, maybe tomorrow. I'm kind of watching my show. I'm kind of doing my thing. I'm with my friend. I'm on vacation. And then the Holy Spirit quit knocking, and you said, life's kind of dull. It's kind of boring. I don't, oops, I don't know what happened, right? <clears throat> and you say, what, 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 what did I do? Why did, why did life stop making sense? Where, where did the fire and excitement for life go? And I would say it might have something to do with, you said, I'm done. I've gotten all I can get. There's no more to learn. There's no more to do. I've done it all. If that's where your life is at, then it's likely, I'm going to put this back on, pardon me, just a moment. Yes. Thank you, Keith. Keith fixed it so I didn't make a bunch of noise again. <clears throat> Thank you, Keith. Um, so the issue here is, at the beginning stage, we all get it. Generally speaking, I need to commit my life to Christ. The difficulty is at some point we say, I'm done. I've arrived. I've matured. I've learned it all. Just tell me the old story and make me feel good again. Tell me the thing that makes me comforted. I'm at the end of it all. I don't, I don't need anything new. I want you to think back to Joshua, though. When he was um, leading the people into Israel... How old was he? Wasn't he like 80 years old? <laughs> and he was still fighting the battle. He was still taking the hill. He was still at war. If you say, oh, but I'm old and tired, then you'll continue to be that way. Some of you might be only 20-something, and you've gotten old and tired really early. <laughs> And I want to challenge you to go back and ask, what dreams has God given you? What dreams has God put in your heart that you haven't lived out? What dreams have you heard that you haven't shared with others? What is it the Holy Spirit has put on your life and you've said, uh, just maybe later, <laughs> I'll get to that another day. I ask you to wake up, to hear again. God's call upon your life to do the next right thing. Because here, this is what they're saying. These people have been faithful as best they could, but in their faithfulness, they killed Jesus. Then they repented of that and said, oh, I've got to do it different. And so they were, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people because of the wind that went through the city, right? And then the fire, and then the language, and the promise from Joel that the young men, the old men, the sons and daughters, the, the men and male servants, maid servants, everybody, all people would hear and dream 
and have a message. What is the message God has put on your heart? Wake up. What is it God has asked you to do to be faithful? Is there a promise you need to keep? Is there a challenge you need to accept? Is there an apology you need to give? Do you need to make a promise? You, what is it you need to do to set the world right as you know God has called you to do? What is it that God has put on your heart that says, <clears throat> I need to wake up? Every day at 11.02, I have an alarm on my phone, pray for the Holy Spirit to fall. Been praying that for a little while. And the reason it's said at that is Acts 11.2, Peter is speaking, the Holy Spirit falls on the people. And he goes, I can't stop it now. We've got to baptize them, folks. <laughs> See, they weren't Jews. When I think about that, I think, God, what have I missed? Where is it that I'm not living the way I should? Call me out for that, God. Show the Holy, through the Holy Spirit's power, show me how to live as you call me to. What is it you're telling me to do? Who needs baptized? Who do I need to go speak to? Who do I need to bake a cake for or make some bread for or invite over for a meal? What is it you've called me to do? And this is where you go back to your life. And you say, oh, my life doesn't matter anymore. That's not true. No matter how old you are, you can pray and you can eat with people, generally speaking. I mean, there are times medically, you know, you can't anymore. But come on. Everybody in this room can pray and eat with people. Am I right? And in doing that, you can have community and you can have encouragement, and you can have growth. And we are called to grow, both individually and in our love for God, but also collectively as a body in numbers. Now next week I'm going to talk about communion, and then we're going to eat. <laughs> we're having a potluck next week. And I believe you're all called to be here again. Even our visitors, you're supposed to come back. I know, God told me. <laughs> That's a little bit of a joke. <laughs> That's where things get a little goofy, isn't it? When somebody says, God told me, I just want you to know I'm joking a bit. But at the same time, maybe you're hearing that though. Maybe God is calling you. Maybe God's saying to you, hey, you know what? I should give this a try. Let's come back next Sunday. Let's try it out. Let's invite some friends. Let's invite some people to come and eat together and, and to consider what God might do through a group of people who are building community together and wanting to live for God. Because that's really all this is about. Faith challenges. You ready? End of the sermon. Can you explain everything? I can't either. I, I can't explain a lot of things. The more I know, the more I know I don't know. When I was really young, I thought I knew everything. The older I get, the more I'm like, I hardly know anything. I'm getting dumber by the day. But I'm reading constantly. I'm studying more and more. Somebody did this. They drew a circle, and they said, this is all the knowledge that the world has. And then here's what you do. Not you, but you know, the people that study for a PhD. They go and get a tiny little PhD, which takes years and tons of research, and they add a tiny little bubble on that, on that thing. And then oftentimes, if they're arrogant, they go, I know it all. I have a PhD. I'm a doctorate. I have a doctor of this or that or the other. But if they're realistic and humble, they go, I learned so much about this one tiny little speck, but I have so much to learn everywhere else. <laughs> right? And that's also the same for us. You've been coming to church for 30, 50 years, and you're like, I've, I've, I've read the Bible, I've learned it. But if you're humble, you say, and I'm still learning. And you keep saying, I can't, I don't know it all. I can't explain everything. And here's the thing, mystery brings wonder. 
When you recognize the mysteries, the things you can't explain, they produce a wonder in you, an excitement in you, a, a happiness, an amazement, and you say, I, I don't get it. I, I don't know. But a part of that is it spurs on study, research, art, enlightenment, entertainment, because you're trying to figure it out, right? Because in some sense, mystery begs an answer. That's why the whodunits, like murder mysteries are so cool, right? And all those other kind of mysteries, you're just like, oh, we know something happened. How did it happen? I'm going to figure it out before everybody else does. Same idea with the Holy Spirit, with God, with creation, with the world around us, right? Life's better with mystery. So a part of all this is, my summation is, this whole sermon is built up to say, where are you hungry and thirsty for more? What is it in your life that you are just saying, I need more? And the more you need is somehow connected to the Holy Spirit. And as you connect to that Holy Spirit, that fills your belly, it fills your soul, it fills your being, and it motivates you to live in a way that is gracious and kind and loving to others. That's the whole hope. So as we go through this sermon series, next Sunday we're talking about communion, then we'll talk about prayer a bit, and we'll talk about singing and worship, maybe a couple other things, we'll see. But I hope you'll come back. I hope you'll be involved with it. And I hope you'll engage again God's spirit and say, what is it you have for me today? How can I live on fire, excited for you? And I ask you to pray with us Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And we pray that we all, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God, even as we pray this, we know that you're saying there's this massive amount of love for us and for everyone. And you want us to know it, and yet it's unknowable. God, that is a mystery. That calls us into your presence and says, help us to understand. Open our eyes that we can see again, God. Open our eyes and our, and our ears and our mouth and our hearts that we can feel and taste you, God, and know your presence. God, may your Holy Spirit fall. May we follow the Spirit. May we feel the wind. May we know the fire. May we be on fire for you, God. May we live in a way that aligns with your Spirit's call. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> this is your invitation. If you need to put on Christ, if you'd like to be baptized, if you need to commit yourself to the church, if you need to commit yourself to Christ before the church, because that's honestly the best place to be, Jesus. If you need to know what it means to, to be a faithful follower, if you want to talk about any of this, if you have any questions, you can call, you can text, you can come forward. You can come talk with me at any time or our elders. Won't you let us know?